So uh, today I would like to show you a little bit how you can use X-ray imaging uh, for heart and lung research, uh, mostly in preclinical um, animal models, because sometimes you think that is not the best way of doing, um, but I hope I can convince you that there are some really nice applications of um, X-ray imaging or in particular micro CT. So I will show a tiny bit of introduction, why micro CT, what's currently the state of the art, um, what are the special requirements for small animals, um, how we deal with motion in the uh, in the animal while imaging. And I will also uh, show you a little bit of what are the special properties of synchrotron micro CT, because you have a synchrotron here in Trieste, and I think you can do very nice work with that. And then I show you a lot of applications, um, basically um, through the 20 years of uh, small animal imaging that I do. Um, I structured in first heart and then lung, uh, and then also in uh, structured in in vivo and ex vivo. And the last thing I like to show you what we plan to develop here at the synchrotron in Trieste uh, to do with patients, lung imaging in patients, unfortunately not heart, um, in the future. Okay, so why micro CT? Um, so this is clearly a very biased talk because I'm doing micro CT. So, uh, but uh, on a serious note, um, X-ray imaging is a very versatile tool. It's true, uh, three-dimensional. Uh, you even can have um, sub-micron resolution and you have applications that range from uh, sub-micron, so uh, sub-cellular resolution uh, to X-ray imaging of uh, galaxies. So you have 20 orders of magnitude uh, in space that you basically use more or less the same technology. That's the only imaging modality I think that can claim that. And another thing is that uh, for X-ray imaging, we need X-rays. And luckily, we can produce X-rays in a very effective way. Uh, so there is the classical X-ray tube uh, developed by Konrad Röntgen. Has a, some upgrades, but the, the, the basic concept is still the same. But we also have synchrotron sources, and you see this is a logarithmic scale uh, in intensity, so we can have very powerful X-ray beams, um, which allows us to be very, very fast. So you have resolution and you can go fast. Um, just that is what you basically all know. Yeah. So what is the contrast in an X-ray image? Uh, it's generated not by, uh, let's say, the entire density of the material, but mainly by the electron density, because the, uh, the core doesn't really interact that much with X-rays. So everything that is dense usually has also a lot of electrons. And that's the reason why you are seeing bones, you see implants, but you don't see a lot of soft tissue. Yeah, this is the downside of X-ray imaging. You can uh, work on that by using contrast agents. Uh, you do in the clinic and uh, uh, all the time. Uh, in the clinic, you have two options. You can either inject it intravenously, then it's usually iodine-based, or you can inject it orally, then it's usually barium-based. Yeah. So, um, and that here you see a mouse before injection, intravenously, after injection. This is actually a tumor-bearing mouse. You see we have a tiny bit more contrast in the tumor, but of course everything like the vessels and the kidneys lights up. Um, and this is just regular clinical contrast agent. Okay, so um, just the, that was the tiny background. So what is the state of the art? Um, because usually people think that you need to have a synchrotron to reach very high resolution. And this is not true. You can also um, use um, bench top, yeah, classical micro CT. Um, the problem in micro CT is that X rays cannot be easily focused. So there are no lenses. Well, it's not true, but it's not an easy way of using lenses. Um, that means the resolution you only achieve by geometrically magnification, and it's limited by the, the focal spot size in your X ray tube. So that means you need to have a very fine focus. And that means you don't generate that much X-rays. And this is done with a, uh, with a micro CT. This is actually paraffin embedded uh, lung tissue from a pig. Um, and you can see that you reach cellular resolution. That was one micron resolution. This took nine hours to measure with a benchtop system. This is two micron resolution I did at a synchrotron. Um, and this took three minutes to measure. Yeah, just, uh, 
saying that most of the things I can show you with, uh, with the synchrotron data can be done also without the synchrotron. It just makes your life very, very difficult. Okay. Um, what are the special requirements if you like to do X-ray imaging in small animals? And there's a very obvious difference. Uh, small animals are very small. Yeah. So uh, that means if you typically do clinical imaging, you uh, can technically reach a resolution of about uh, half a millimeter, half a millimeter by one millimeter, something like that. But we usually don't use that because this also uh, increases a tiny bit the X-ray dose. So we, ah, hi, Marco. Um, we go in the clinic something, uh, something like one by one by even um, more millimeter resolution. Um, if you do that in a mouse, uh, then you basically get no information anymore. So just as a comparison, and these are the, the ossicles, so the tiniest bones that we have uh, in a human. This is an, an, an old German penny. Yeah? So you, this is something like 17 millimeter. So in humans, we are happy if we see the ossicles in the inner ear. Um, if you would have a resolution that just gives you the, the, the idea that we are there, that is more than half of the skull of the mouse. So we need more resolution. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you think about bone, that means uh, the trabecular structure inside uh, um, the humans has usually a separation of one millimeter in a mouse, typically 10 microns. Yeah? The next problem is um, that also all the other uh, processes like heart rate and breathing are much faster in mice and in other small animals. So you see heart rate, um, 450 BPM up to 750 BPM, depends a little bit on the anesthesia that you use. Um, breathing is, um, so under deep anesthesia, I usually can slow down the breathing of uh, the mouse to have one breathing event in one, 1.5 seconds. If I go even deeper, then it's not so nice for the mouse. Okay, so we need high resolution and everything is moving. Yeah. Uh, next problem is, I already showed you that image. If you use with uh, clinical contrast agents, then you have another problem because it's very fast excreted. So uh, typically, after this is done after 60 seconds after injection of the contrast agent. And it's already mostly in the kidney and starting to, uh, to go into the bladder. So also on the, on the topic of contrast agents, you need to think a little bit different. So these are the main challenges. The problem is if you increase the resolution, um, I told you this is something that you can not easily achieve. Um, it usually requires more extremes. And on the, let's say, conserv conservative side, um, if you increase the resolution by a factor of two, you uh, need to increase the dose by the power of three, maybe even four. Yeah, So there is a lot more extremes. Okay. That brings us to the question, how much x dose can I actually do? Um, and that is interesting because I was growing up in the impression that um, everything that will survive the, the Third World War will be rats and rodents, and uh, so they should tolerate more x dose than we are. Um, actually, you don't find so much data about this uh, in the internet. There is one um, value that's called the IT5030. So this is um, how much dose you uh, need to kill 50% of your population in within one month, in, within 30 days. Yeah. So we, feel, uh, we think about uh, full uh, X-ray exposure and what dose that we need. Uh, and this is the only thing that I could find. And okay, I don't explain you in detail what the millisievert is, but just say that's dose. Um, and you see humans, you need between three and five gray or sievert to uh, effectively kill 50% of the population in that with, um, uh, within one month. And if you see mouse, it's roughly the same. Yeah? So we are not that much more um, dose efficient or um, you can use more dose than means. Okay. Um, there are a lot of things about um, how much dose you should use. The, 
X-ray imaging in humans is mostly limited by the fact that you don't like to cause an increased cancer risk in the entire lifespan, let's say 18 years, something like this. Um, if you consider a mouse, a mouse lives about two years. In your experiment, typically, I don't know, one month, maybe a bit longer. Um, so cancer risk is not, or uh, induced cancer risk is not a big concern. So let's say we can go a little bit higher than we do uh, for human scanning, but um, not extremely high, yeah? Because at a certain point you will uh, also interfere with your animal, yeah? Okay, so there is not so much difference. I already told you that. There is one paper that says that a mouse brain is a little bit more um, dose uh, independent, let's say, than a human brain. But I think this is just the limit of the behavioral testing. Uh, you just don't know uh, when the mouse starts to suffer. Um, okay, so you always need to think about the brains. Good. Um, now, one few words about all the motion. Um, so the problem is, since we need to have enough flux, enough photons to make a decent image. And you probably know CT images works like that, that you rotate either the object or you rotate the X-ray tube and the detector around uh, the mouse or the patient and uh, collect a lot of images. And with a lot, I mean in the range of more than 1,000 uh, to be able to reconstruct the cross-sections. So uh, that usually takes a, uh, some time. In patients, we can now do one rotation in half a second. Uh, for small animal systems, is typically not much faster than 15, 16 seconds. So you will clearly, clearly have uh, multiple breathing events and clearly a lot of heartbeats uh, in, during the acquisition. So um, there are two strategies. So you either could stop the acquisition wait uh, for a certain um, phase of the uh, heartbeat and a certain phase of the uh, of the breathing and then make the next acquisition that will take quite quite some long uh, quite some time the other option is that you acquire more data and then you try to understand which data has been acquired in which condition and this is what we call retrospective gating and if you just measure the intensity in this area and this is over time and also over the rotation. Yeah, uh, I cut the huge peaks. The huge peaks are from the breathing. And you see these tiny variations are the heartbeat. And now you can just uh, split the data into multiple sets, either for the lung and or for the heart. And then if you have enough data, and enough means that you acquire more than you would do for a static object, uh, and then you again think about the dose, then you can reconstruct different artificial different uh, steps in the briefing cycle or in the uh, in the heart cycle keep in mind that this is compiled by a lot of different uh, data from different heartbeats so um, if the heart is beating not very regularly then you have another tiny problem but it's working okay so um, now what is the 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 special property or the special ability of synchrotron imaging that you can do here. Um, so you know this, so we can do CT, I told you is 3D imaging. Uh, the contrast is based on its X-ray absorption or, um, or attenuation. That means there is dose in the body that makes a lot of negative e effects. And we deal with, let's say one property that is contrast to noise. Yeah, we like to have a decent contrast and a, a certain amount of noise to make a, a decent image. Uh, so we always need to balance the dose because the dose is harmful for the patient with the contrast to noise. Um, if you have special X-rays, meaning the X-rays are coherent, then you can use some wave properties of the X-rays and you get uh, interference effects that you can use to uh, boost the imaging or the contrast. And one of those techniques is uh, what we also use here. It's called free propagation phase contrast. And the idea is if you have these, uh, sorry, uh, if you have these um, in coherent X-rays, you just go away with the detector. Uh, the sample will not only attenuate the X-rays, but also disturb the wavefront, which causes local um, interference and that you can use for much uh, higher soft contrast, soft tissue contrast. 
And this is a very nice study from uh, Marcus Kitchen from Australia. So the top row is what you usually would think about. So very close detector behind this was, I think, um, rabbit lung. Um, so you see, if you don't use a lot of X-rays, um, you don't get a decent image. There's a lot of noise. If you choose, uh, use more dose, more X-rays, more X-rays, more X-rays, you get a decent image. But that means a lot of dose for your patient, for your living subject, whatever. If you just go away uh, with the detector and do some post-processing, then you see that at the same dose level, but now with two meters of propagation distance, we get very nice images. So just we basically use this uh, coherence property to make a bigger handle on the dose property to the image, right? And if you compare this done with the same X-ray dose, one not using the phase contrast, one using the phase contrast. And this already tells you why I'm interested to do that in patients. And I uh, will come to that. Okay, so now that was the, the physics starting point. Um, I now show you just pretty images. Right? So heart research, ex vivo, what can you do? Um, the very old school approach is casting. You probably know that. You can just put a casting agent, agent in the vessels. The good thing is that the cast, casting agent usually is also a material that has a little bit uh, higher attenuation. So you can either dissolve the tissue around or you can just keep it and do X-ray imaging for that. So you, you have a mechanical cast of the heart and you make a 3D image just using your micro CT. Um, there are other options. Uh, casting is uh, an old technique, but you need to be skilled in that. Yeah? Because if you inject, the, so first you need to flush the vessels, otherwise you stop the casting agent because you have blood clots or something like that. Um, then you need to inject it by uh, with a lot of pressure or with a decent amount of pressure because this is a resin that gets very uh, sticky, let's say. Uh, if you do too much, you break the vessels. If you don't do uh, enough, you don't reach the uh, the last generations of the vessels. It's not that easy. Uh, there's another thing that you can do is just take the entire heart and dump it in a staining solution. Um, I use uh, phosphor tungstic acid. This is part of the Masnan trichrome staining. Um, and the tungsten ions will diffuse into the heart. Um, it takes some time. I think the heart takes something like six, seven, eight days. It depends on... Uh, uh, this is mouse, by the way, right? Um, and then you have a lot of contrast. You can just use a classical micro CT and you get decent images. Um, and I don't need to, to tell you that uh, there is a lot of advantages of having the thing 3D. So that was the entire heart embedded, at, I think, at that time in Agarose jail. So you can virtually cut in any direction. This is, oh, I need to press the correct button. Uh, this is the aortic valve. So you have no problems to uh, to cut through the aortic valve, get 3D information. And you see, you can also do histology afterwards. And I will later show you how we actually merge the data nowadays. So something for which you would like to have 3D information is, for instance, if you like to uh, understand how big the uh, um, burden of aortic uh, uh, arteriosclerotic plaques are. So this was an APOE mouse model. And you see, I can easily segment, uh, at least in a later stage, uh, the, the plaque formation and get a better idea about this uh, uh, plaque load in the mouse. Uh, and this is now synchrotron data, but it's also a stained heart, mouse heart. Uh, you can scan the entire thing and you can easily slice through it and analyze the valves if you are interested. Good. Just um, so there are multiple options uh, what you can do. Um, how, what can we do in vivo? Okay, in vivo is tricky because the heart is beating fast. Yeah, so I showed you this trick with the gating. So we can uh, do something, but um, what is it good for? So you clearly need a, a contrast agent um, because otherwise the contrast between heart and blood is not very high. Um, where are uh, couple of interesting contrast agents. One example is uh, a contrast agent called Axia. Um, this is um, a contrast agent that is first a blood pool. That means it has a prolonged half-life time in the blood. Because to make a decent image, uh, you see I use two minutes. With a normal iodine-based contrast agent, you don't get anything in it. 
So you see, I nicely see the blood vessels. This is also uh, retrospective gating. So you see there is no motion blurring of the heart. So you can study all the vessels, the heart chambers and so on. The interesting part is, and this was, uh, the dose was not extremely high, and this is 100 micron resolution. I think nowadays I can even do a bit better. Um, so the interesting point comes now. If you just leave the mouse alone for, let's say, four or six hours, then this contrast agent gets uh, metabolized by the myocardium and the brown fat. So you have a reverse contrast. It's not extremely bright. But you can see you have now contrast in the mule car. <laughs> this is, to be honest, a bit late. I waited eight hours because at that time I was interested in brown fat and not in the myocardium. Um, but if you do something like four to six hours, you have a decent contrast in the mule car. Um, the interesting point is that parts in which the metabolism of the myocardium is not working, like in a stroke model or a heart, um, a heart attack model, you don't get contrast. So you have a good way of in vivo seeing the, um, uh, the let's say, the size of this stroke-affected area, right? Um, and this is what I like to show you here. This is actually from the Erasmus Medical Center in the Netherlands, not my data. Um, same CT, same contrast agent. And again, this trick with the retrospective gating, uh, splitting the data in diastolic and systolic, and you can then also do... Um, functional analysis of the data. It's not pretty nice in the resolution, but keep in mind that's a mouse. Um, I will not try to explain you that because I'm not a hard person, but just saying that you can do this functional analysis. And this was a, um, a ligation model. So we blocked one uh, big uh, vessel and caused this um, heart attack. And uh, this is 10 minutes after the injection. So you have the blood pool phase. Um, and this is um, the same mouse, or not the same mouse, it's one mouse three hours after the ligation. So you can clearly uh, calculate that these functional parameters are going down because the mouse had an heart attack. And you can even, because this is not a lot of X-ray dose, you can do longitudinal studies. So you can also um, first make this colorful um, uh, analysis of the data, but you can also uh, keep the mouse let the mouse recover and then see actually how much the, um, the function has recovered over time. Yeah. And yeah, I think it mostly works only with this particular contrast agent, but you can do that. I also did heart imaging in living zebrafish in the CT. That was tricky. I, I think I needed well, half a year to just get the anesthesia, right? Because the fish should not swim. Uh, swim yeah, so that, that will be difficult. But uh, you see, this is okay. My secret is a delusion of propofol. Yeah, so okay. Um, so you see, the fish is actually breathing here. And you, this is the heart. And I also injected contrast agent into the heart. Uh, that was also tricky. So now we do this retrospective gating uh, again. So um, we analyze the data over the rotation. It's a bit noisy because it's uh, at the edge of the resolution of my system. But we can also try to split it in uh, systolic and diastolic. And so these are just uh, slices. So you see a tiny bit that this part of the heart is beating. Yeah? So you get, uh, here also you see whatever valve, uh, I don't know how it's called in the fish actually. Um, so you get a functional readout and the fish survives that. So you could even do that longitudinal. Uh, so um, it needs a lot of practicing, uh, to be honest, but it can be done. Uh, and, and some of the zebra fish models are very interested for heart dystrophy and uh, other stuff. Okay. Um, moving to lung research. So you will see that this is my main focus. Um, so what can we do actually? And I like to show you one study that is from a um, um, PhD student. He just finished uh, from here, from Trieste, Lorenzo. And Lorenzo is now in Australia. Um, and he studied um, two different lung fibrosis models in mice. Uh, you probably know better than me what lung fibrosis is, but just to wrap it up. So you see on one side, this is a healthy lung. And in fibrosis, you see that you get uh, these uh, damage to the alveoli and the bronchioles, and you get a lot of fiber deposition. 
And clearly this uh, impairs the function of the lung. The uh, point is that there are a lot of different causes that can lead to this uh, situation. And also this is usually progressive, at least in humans, and it's very difficult to um, cure it. No, basically there are no cure yet. Um, and so the question is, are these very different um, reasons uh, or to cause this for process where is it, there is even the so-called idiopathic one in which we don't know the reason. Um, so is it always the same disease? Just tiny back, uh, background story. I was doing my PhD in asthma and I always thought as a physicist, asthma is one disease. And then I learned that asthma describes symptoms and we are actually having six different diseases that makes the same symptoms. And uh, they are totally uh, quite different in which cells are involved. Most of them are based on eosinophils, some of them based on macrophages. So, um, and so my idea or the, the assumption was that maybe in fibrosis is a bit, bit like that. We describe the symptoms. So you have a lot of fibers and you have the damage, but maybe it's not the same disease that lies below. Yeah. So the question is, how can we understand? So are there any differences? So, uh, and there's a total no cure yet. So the, the idea was to set up an imaging pipeline to understand or to better characterize uh, pulmonary fibrosis and even if possible, find subtypes. And to test this, uh, we needed um, a testing system. This is an animal system. And of course we needed two because if you like to see differences, you should yeah, use at least two different ones. The question is, uh, what are different fibrosis models? Uh, so we moved to mice because they are more standardized, less comorbidities and so on. Uh, and maybe useful to establish that. And then later we could use, uh, could move to patient material. Uh, two models. And the first model is what you all know probably is the classical bleomycin induced uh, pulmonary fibrosis. So this is the, um, the setup of the experiment. So we induced uh, bleomycin, um, then you, uh, we treated even some mice with metendanib, some got only a, a vehicle, uh, and then we measured, I will show you what the, the planar X-ray imaging is doing. We measured by micro CT every week to see the progression and also maybe the therapy response. And after that, uh, we uh, sacrificed the mice, harvested the lung um, and embedded in paraffin and then do high resolution imaging. On the other side, we have a genetic model. That's the NET42 conditional knockout model that more naturally develops fibrosis. And so our idea was if we have a chemical one and a genetic one, hopefully also the fibrosis patterns are different. Um, so this is what you usually would do for the analysis of fibrosis in mouse models. So you put it in paraffin, you slice it, you stain it, you do a, a microscopic analysis. And there are established uh, scoring procedures. Uh, most of the time people use the modified Ashcroft score, um, which gives you only um, let's say a measure of uh, severity of the fibrotic disease. So um, this is a tiny test of uh, for you. So this is this is a lung. Actually, I pieced it together from two different mice that received the same Ashcroft score. Um, so what would you say is the genetic one? What would you say the blamycin one? Tricky, right? So. Um, the problem is that maybe histology is not really informative for that. And that's the point. Yeah, because um, people, of course, looked for fibrosis uh, for many years, and they still say that it's more or less one disease. And the, the, the reason for that is we look uh, on the data like this, we do the scoring, and the scoring tells you this is the same, more or less. Yeah. Okay. So um, that was the, the starting point. Um, and yeah, okay, Ashcroft with between 0 and 8, the modified Ashcroft, um, and this is a 4 on both sides. Yeah. Okay, so, and the left one is the genetic one, and the right one was the real one. Okay, we move to the synchrotron. Again, uh, this is an, uh, a different slide, but um, just saying that this is without the phase contrast, this is with phase contrast, so we don't need to do these 
um, staining protocols. I don't need tungsten. I don't need anything. I just use the phase effect. So you have your regular FFPE tissues, the regular paraffin block. You can even take it from the hospital, uh, from your favorite pathologist that has it uh, in uh, on, on stock, let's say. So you can retrospectively analyze the data from also patients. We do now in a, a large uh, study about colon cancer and we use data um, paraffin blocks that have been uh, acquired over 20 years. Yeah. Um, so this is how the setup looks like. The beam is stationary. Yeah, Remember, we are at the synchrotron. The synchrotron is a building. We cannot turn the beam. Uh, so we need to turn the specimen. So here is the specimen. That's my paraffin block. And this is just a rotator, a little bit of adjustment. And this is the detector um, that uh, gives me the images. And I use 15 centimeter behind the object to get a decent phase contrast. Uh, OK, on top. After the 3D imaging, we slice the paraffin block, and then we use the slices for other subsequent analysis. One thing we were interested in is atomic force microscopy to measure the local stiffness of the tissue to see if maybe different fiber deposition causes different uh, ch uh, characteristic changes in the mechanical properties. I know this is a bit limited because the, uh, the, uh, the tissue was formally fixed, uh, dehydrated, paraffin embedded, it needs to be uh, deparaffinized, rehydrated, but it will still stay fixed. So, of course, the mechanical properties are not the ones uh, that you have physiologically, but um, I hope you will, um, our hope was that still the differences out there. Um, so atomic force microscopy is a little bit like an old uh, record player. So you have this kind of needle, you press it on the subject, uh, this will bend the needle. There is a laser and a tiny mirror here that will convert the bending to a deflection on the detector. And from that, you can calculate the mechanical properties below the tiny needle. Uh, this is very, I hope no FEFM people are here. Okay, no, okay. That was a very uh, short explanation. Um, what we did afterwards is we calculated the Young's modulus and um, Below actually is an inverted microscope. So we also know the position where we measure. And we converted the information into something like a 3D bar plot to have, again, 3D information that we can fuse with, with the other data. Um, we did more. We did also some fancy spectroscopic analysis that you also can do at the synchrotron. It's called uh, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. In a nutshell, that uh, analyzes on the different wavelengths the fluorescence of uh, of your subject can you can also be done in uh, in paraffin slices um, and it gets more or less specific. So these are the different types of collagen. So you see there are tiny differences. So we get more or less a, spe um, a specific difference between collagen one and collagen three, and we thought maybe that is helpful. So now um, we have basically the paraffin block we scanned in 3D. Then we did the sectioning. Also, the 3D information helps us to find the fibrotic region because typically it's a little bit patchy and you can spend a long time cutting the specimen and are still in the healthy region. And of course, we like to have also the fibrotic region. So after this informed cutting, which I call guided sectioning, uh, we ended up putting the specimen in the normal histology in this uh, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy and then the IFM. And then we later fused all the data together. There is one big problem. Uh, the problem is that the cutting deforms your tissue. Um, you know, a microtome is a static plate. You press the paraffin block against that or the plate against the paraffin block, depends on what you are using. Um, and the the lung is a very porous, squishy uh, tissue, so we will certainly deform it. To overlay that uh, with the CT data is a bit tricky, but we developed something that's called uh, elastic registration, so that basically uh, stretches your tissue locally back to really fit to the original uh, data. Um, first, I show you that now the combined analysis uh, from all these things. So uh, the blue parameters are um, anatomical analysis in the 3D CT data, um, different types of 
surface of the alveoli, uh, um, volume of the tissue, including the fibers, and so on and so on. Um, then this comes from the um, histology analysis from the collagen, the collagen bond content, or it's the T analysis. Okay. Um, and this is uh, the analysis from the AFM, so the elasticity. And if we use all these parameters combined, we can do agglomerative clustering. And the interesting part is uh, on this biggest hierarchy level, you can see that we split the data into one, uh, two big groups. And this is basically the split between the healthy ones, green, and the two fibrosis model. And the two yellow ones that are in between are two treated mice that are just put in to see what happens. Um, if you go one uh, hierarchy deeper, you see that the fibrotic are nicely split into the uh, bleomycin ones, red, and the genetic ones. There's one outlier. Okay. Um, and you also see that uh, um, the these two treated ones perform either like healthy or like fibrotic. And we checked in the treated ones, one seems not to be treated very well. Um, the interesting point is I didn't use the score, so the, uh, the Ashcroft score. And you see here that the Ashcroft score is actually uh, not very informative. Yeah, And we know that before, because before we didn't saw any difference between the models. So uh, just to demonstrate that, um, you can do more than the Ashcroft score, and there seems to be something different between the two models. I need to now uh, dig deeper and uh, try to analyze what is the difference. But you get the impression that the two models do something differently in formation of the fibrosis. Um, and now I need to show you how that fusion of the data looks like. Uh, ah, so th this is already what I told you. This is. Um, just histology, the green on top is a very tiny microsecond data set. And you see that after the slicing, um, the tissue was pushed away. So you need to compensate for that. Okay, I don't know if you really see that. So this is what we call a checkerboard uh, uh, validation. So the tiny checkers are either uh, CT or histology to see if they really match. So this is after this elastic registration process. And now I hope I can show you, yes. So this is the CT data uh, from the synchrotron. So you can get rid virtually of the paraffin. And then we now virtually cut the block at the same position we later cut manually. Then we place the histology inside. This is just how we analyze the data, not so important. So you see the histology. This is polarized light uh, histology also of the same staining. Um, so you see you have the 3D information, you have the uh, normal histology information. This is the spectroscopic measurement for collagen 1 and collagen 3. And now you see that I can even place the AFM data on roughly the correct cells in the 3D context of the, uh, of the micro CT. Yeah. So this is now the pipeline. It still takes some work to put everything together. But this is the pipeline that we are now using for certain, uh, for a lot of different uh, applications. Um, what is the real benefit, uh, a part of being looks really fancy, what is the real benefit of having this 3D data? And I'd like to show you two examples. So this is another mouse model, and um, you see also these, um, what radiologists call uh, micro honey camping because they don't see it in detail, and you usually see some kind of holes. Um, so alveolar, alveolar damage that causes these holes in the lamp. You also see it in CT, but if you, uh, sorry, in histology, but if you uh, use CT, you can segment the holes, and you actually see that these are not isolated holes. These are a duct system. So that means that the alveolar damage is I guess is a little bit based on the uh, secretion of some uh, inflammatory fluid or something that causes a duct system. So it's a totally different assumption than just call it honeycomb. Yeah. Uh, and with auto 3D, and now we can even place uh, electron microscopy also in the data. So you see CT, histology, and electron microscopy. Um, another thing which I find very uh, impressive so this was. A piece of uh, porcine lung, so pig lung, embedded in paraffin, scanned in the same way. You have the histology on top. And there is this very old, uh, not that old, but uh, is the, this 
what is a paper that called what makes a, a, a good lung and we proposed um, that the inner structure of the lung is also kind of like an elastic skeleton so if you think about you exhale air and still your lung is not collapsing locally so why is it not collapsing because somebody keeps it open so you have a kind of spring-like system in the lung that prevents the alveoli from collapsing um, and this is something in histology that uh, is typically uh, called like uh, yeah we, we call it tips yeah because in the cut section uh, you only see a tiny cut through this kind of 3d structure and uh, we use this so we uh, use the the registration of the histology to be able to really isolate these uh, these elastine tips and then we could segment in 3d and we can really demonstrate that this assumption is true yeah so you have these 3d axial um, connective tissue that keeps the lung structure open and now you have also a method to um lo to look on damage on this one yeah so um okay so i'm very hyped about this um okay and um, now the in vivo part so um, X-ray imaging for lungs is actually pretty cool because uh, for many um, imaging technologies, lungs poses a big problem. Yeah, because there is a lot of air inside. Uh, so uh, imaging methods like MRI that uh, in which the signal is produced by tissue have a big problem because there is more air than tissue. Uh, for X-rays, it's fine because the air acts as a natural negative contrast agent for us. So we can do a very simple thing. We can just do planar imaging, uh, let the mouse breathe. So we make a video and we analyze how the brightness in the lung changes over time. And this gives you these curves, little bit of background correction, doesn't matter. And this is old data and this was an asthma model. So the blue curve is, uh, is a healthy mouse. Uh, again, this is not noise, that's the heartbeat. Yeah? So you see also the heartbeat. Um, this is a severe uh, alveolar uh, inflammation model, uh, should not call it asthma. I was informed by the immunologist because asthma is something that doesn't exist in mice that you generate. Yeah? Uh, so I would call it something an like asthma-like model. And you clearly see that um, the peak is reduced uh, because you have a lot of inflammation going on that reduces the brightness. And um, you also see that this expiration that's the exp uh, exhalation expiration phase that the expiration phase is prolonged and this is what you know from asthmatic patients we have more problems to exhale air than to inhale which is most likely due to the destruction of the elastin fibers in the lung so the lung gets uh, less elastic and since the the expiration is more a uh, self-contraction of the lung and if the lung is not elastic and uh, anyway so you can see um, and this is a dexamethasone treated mouse and you see that is going a little bit back to the, the normal condition. A very simple low dose measurement that you can easily do longitudinally. You can also extract the data from uh, rotational data. So you get a little bit of the same curves. It's more tricky to do, but can be done. Uh, and you get functional parameters and you can get the 3D parameters as well. So I already told you that you can split the data into um, um, inhalation and ex exhalation phase and recont uh, reconstruct those separately. And you can also just um, analyze the surface. So we have an outer surface, skin against air, and we have the inner surface, lung tissue against air. So if you extract the outer surface, um, and here I basically took two from, so the inspiration phase and the expiration phase, and I measured the local difference. So this is just color scale, the local difference. So you see there's a lot of going on in the chest, breathing, okay. Um, and you see that this is mostly done in the mouse by moving the lower part, so the diaphragm is going up and down, yeah. Um, here, this is an asthmatic mouse. So you see that the movement of the diaphragm is reduced. Um, the lung actually also appears bigger because it's just less elastic, so the diaphragm is sitting lower. And uh, if you check what's going on, you see that this appears. And this is what we call forced expiration. So the mouse is actually activating some intercostal muscles, additional muscles to press the air out. Yeah, And you can easily see that. Longitudinal, uh, you can do treatment and whatever you like. 
Um, you can even do more functional imaging. Uh, one option is also to use a contrast agent for the airways. Um, so the, there is a, a fancy method using Xenon. Xenon has uh, what we call an, um, an absorption edge that has something to do with how the uh, electrons are organized. And in this, with synchrotron imaging, we can uh, use single wavelengths, so single energies for imaging. So you can use one image bef before the edge and one time uh, after the edge, and you do a subtraction. And uh, since the edges are very specific for different elements, you get an image that is very specific for your center. So you can mix the center into the, um, the ventilation of your mouse, and you get a functional uh, image of, over the ventilation in the living mouse. Oh, actually, this was a rabbit. Um, and this was, again, an over-albumin uh, um, model, so kind of asthma model. Um, and you see that in the in the asthmatic case, you have a strong um, problem with the inflammation, uh, uh, ventilation, sorry, uh, with the one ventilation. Um, and you can see how this basically improves um, during recovery. And, so on. and it's also a function. Of to be honest, that was a little bit more dose. So I, I'm not sure if I would do that in that amount of dose very longitudinal, but uh, can be done. Um, they even did that. And you can, if you increase the resolution, you can even see that from uh, breathing event to breathing event, the xenon is distributed a tiny bit differently. And also that you have diffusion effects. So it's not only ventilation, you can also study the diffusion of the air in the lung, which is very cool. And to even improve this, so this is, by the way, uh, all done by Sembayat in Grenoble, so not my work. Um, you can do this pH imaging, not only for xenon, but also for iodine. Uh, so you use iodine for, uh, as a normal contrast agent uh, for the blood supply, for the vessels, and xenon, you do this KH imaging. So now you need at least three images to have both KHs. But now you have a functional readout for the ventilation and the perfusion in the lung. Yeah, And uh, this is just some test, uh, test that, we, uh, that we did. Uh, changing the parameters of the ventilator. Yeah, so just saying that you can have not only the 3D image that you get for free, uh, but you also have this functional. Okay, ten minutes. I will manage. Ah, last chapter. Okay, so uh, now I like to show you what um, we hope to achieve together with uh, Professor Confernieri for the patients here in Trieste in the future, and. Um, so what is the, the clinical challenge? The clinical challenge uh, is that we cannot use the CT in a patient to its full technical potential because of the exodus. So this is something that we consider to be a good image. And you clearly see that something is going on in the lung that's patient here. Yeah? So you see this is an area. So this is normal um, brightness. A lot of air makes a dark pixel. Yeah. Here you see this is brighter. Uh, and this is completely consolidated. Yeah, it looks like soft tissue. So the thing that is brighter, we call we call ground glass opacity, which tells you something is going on. But the question is what? Yeah, and there are actually a lot of possible reasons why a pixel can get brighter. So you can have either less air, yeah, makes it brighter. That means uh, alveolar columns. You can have liquid blood. Uh, inflammation that makes it also bright. Totally different thing. Yeah. Um, you can have more tissue or more fibers, like the fibrotic case, yeah? makes it also bright. So this is not very informative. Um, and in the worst case, uh, what if we really have no idea what's going on, we will make a biopsy. Yeah. We will stick a needle in, uh, in you and get a piece of tissue out. And uh, think about an organ that should be airtight, like a balloon. Sticking a needle inside is not a very smart idea. Yeah. So, but there's no other way. So, um, in this case, we showed afterwards that it was actually more tissue. So this was fibrosis. Yeah. Okay. So, finishing the, the introduction, we need more resolution, but we cannot because there's no, we cannot increase the dose. So we need to be better, less dose, but more resolution. 
And this is what we try to develop, and we do that in Pig Labs. So we have a phantom. I will show you we have a new phantom now in which we put a healthy, uh, fresh pig lung, and we can remove the air between these artificial chest walls and the lung. So uh, the lung is inhaling air passively from outside. So we don't force air inside. It's just, uh, let's say, the normal way. Um, and it's also less, um, it causes less damage to the tissue. And this phantom can be scanned at the synchrotron. You see in upright position because I need to turn this best, the, the phantom because the beam is stationary. And we can also put it in the clinical CT for comparison. So this is um, a comparison. So we have patient data on the, uh, on the first uh, column. So this is a patient with a solid nodule. Uh, so you can see this thing it appears to be not normal. And this is the typical resolution that the radiologist has. So the radiologist will tell you, okay, this looks not normal, um, but that's the end of it. Yeah. Um, even worse, this is called a subsolid nodule. So you see, you have this kind of um, diffuse ground glass opacities, and this is acute respiratory distress syndrome. Okay, you see that. Yeah. Just this is not a big problem. Um, so. In the pig lung, we needed to simulate the, these patterns by injecting uh, warm agarose mixed with a little bit of iodine. Um, and this is the pig lung being scanned in the clinical scan. So we simulated something like a solid nodule. You also have some structures that is uh, simulating the subsolid nodules. And this was actually a, a pig disease model for RDS. Um, and this is now our imaging result. Same pig, same position same x-ray dose but at the synchrotron and you clearly see that now it's clear that this is a solid nodule but you also see this uh, filled alveoli that you barely understand here and let's say the, the the our goal is to make images that good that you can avoid having biopsies yeah of course we would not put any patient inside so just in the case the radiologist cannot or all the people uh, discussing the, the data cannot agree on a certain disease. We can probably um, provide better images in just this case to uh, make a better decision. Yeah, that's the idea. And this was a pig lung. Uh, luckily, the pig had pneumonia. Uh, so uh, you see that we can easily see these more dense structures. Again, this is clinical relevant X-ray rules. Yeah? So this is nothing. Um, let's say, dangerous for the patient. Um, in the clinic, you have a resolution of, I, I was on the slide before, half a millimeter, half a millimeter by one millimeter. This is 0 0.07 millimeter in 3D, same excellence. Okay, uh, and last, and I'm pretty much in time, I'm happy. Uh, so um, this is the new phantom. So the new phantom also has an outer shell that mimics the absorption of the uh, of the chest. Uh, it also has this artificial spine and rib structure inside that mimics the absorption of the bone. There is a motion control, so we can even move the lung inside. It's not a real breathing because the chest will not deform, but it's the, the best we can do. So we can even simulate a little bit of breathing. Uh, the, the the opening, the trachea is accessible, so you can do bronchoscope uh, imaging, not while I scan because we are X-rays, but in between the imaging. Uh, or think about any other thing you need to uh, access the lung from inside. Um, and this is just data I acquired um, three weeks ago. The, um, in the moment, we have a problem with the current setup because the beam is not very high. So, uh, but we plan to build a new setup together with the upgrade of the Italian synchrotron, which uh, will then also have a beam of five to six centimeter. Um, and of course, a low X-ray dose to do that in patients. And yes, so um, the Phantom can, can be used. So it's property of the Italian synchrotron. So if you're interested in doing that, uh, contact the, uh, the, the, my colleagues from the Italian Synchrotron or Yugo Bioimaging, um, and then you can use the Phantom. Yeah? And that brings me to the last point. I showed you a lot of fancy stuff, uh, inclu uh, including the Synchrotron, and then 
I always get the same comments. Yeah, but this is nice. You can go to the synchrotron. I cannot. Uh, that's not true. Yeah, you can, for instance, apply to Yugo Bioimaging. Um, they will guide you, and you can have access to synchrotron and uh, a lot of other cutting edge uh, imaging devices free of charge. We even we even pay the travel for you. Yeah, so uh, it's not that nobody can access. Good, and of course, this was done with a lot of people. So. Uh, the Italian Synchrotron, uh, my home university in Göttingen, uh, Max Planck Institute, uh, German Lung Research Center, BioQuant for the SAM imaging, um, Catinara Hospital in Trieste, University Trieste, uh, I showed you data from the Erasmus University, uh, the mouse model, the Net42 uh, genetic model is from the uh, Charité in Berlin, and there are also some collaborations with companies. Um, yeah, and I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I have done it. Yeah, perfect.